God is good, isn't it? We're going to continue in 1 John. You know, I really got to thinking about this as, we were, as I was preparing this, and we're still on in-day spiritual warfare. Really, you don't hear a lot of messages out of 1 John. And the problem is, 1 John is filled with landmines of, for, against modern theology. I mean, I mean, this apostle of love just kind of tells it how it is. He, you know, he tells you how the cow chews the cabbage, doesn't he? And uh, I love it. Um, I've got outlined all the way to the end of 1 John. I've only got 11 points this morning. But what I've done is I've set my timer because when I hit an hour, I'm, we'll pick up next week. You can't, you can't uh, do it all in one day, can you? There's just so much here. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Right there, the body has lost the understanding of just the amount of love God bestowed upon us. Somehow or another, we have lost the power of what Jesus did for us at the cross. We have, we have made it some cheap thing that did not cost heaven anything, and therefore we don't really have to respond with a deep love. We have cheapened the gospel, we have cheapened the cost, and therefore we have cheapened our response to that word, to that gospel. But yet the Apostle John says, we need, to, we need to behold, we need to see what manner of love God had for us. That when Adam fell in the garden, God created a plan to begin to work that plan. It took him 4,000 years to be able to bring, come to the place where he could come on this earth and to give his life for us. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I mean, the cross was not an easy thing. It was a hard thing. And yet we, we preach anymore like the cross was an easy thing, like, raising, like winning in hell and raising victorious three days over, over death, hell, and the grave was an easy thing. I mean, you know, from, it was a hard thing. It was a hard thing. And yet we respond by this much love. The Apostle Paul is against that. That's part of the Antichrist spirit, that we no longer respect God, that we no longer respect the price he paid for us, and we, did, we, just, we just give him kind of tips here and there with our lives. And in the midst of all this, he, you know, the Apostle Paul or John here is talking about really defining what the spirit of Antichrist is and, and how what God has done on the inside of us, the total opposite of that, and that we keep his commandments and that we walk in love with one another and that we walk in love with God. And he said, here's why we do it. Behold what manner of love that almighty God, and, and while we're still here on the earth, while we're still frail, if you will, and that we, we, we do stumble into sin and occasionally, but yet in the midst of the mess that we call life, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can call ourselves Bene Elohim the sons of God. I tell you what, I think there's still angels in heaven scratching their head over that one. And then we take it like it's just cheap grace. Our theologies have cheapened grace. Heaven has not. Listen what the next verse, or the rest of this verse says, Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. The world don't understand. The moment you got saved, the moment that Jesus Christ really became the Lord and Savior of your, of your life, you died to this world, and this world died to you. You're no longer of this world. You can't relate with it. I, I don't know about you guys, but you know, especially the way the things have kind of gone both in the church and in the United States and in the world last couple of years, it's like I woke up one morning and I, was, and I, I feel like I, I woke up on a parallel universe and, and everything just ain't quite right. And I, I, I turn on Christian television and things just ain't quite right. And I turn on the news and things aren't just quite right. And, and I listen to our politicians and I'm thinking, 
you know, it, it ranges from what medication does the doctor have you on to are you are permanently stuck on stupid. Because what they're saying, it's the, it's the way that the world is going. If you're not following God, you're brain damaged. Now they may look at us like, we're brain damaged, but you know, a sane person in a loony bin would appear weird. We're not of the world, and so why are we constantly trying to get the world to accept us? I'm wanting heaven to accept me. I'm wanting heaven to back me up. I'm wanting heaven to do these things, and you can't do it by playing footsies with the world. There has to be a stark difference between the world and the kingdom of God. Now, listen to what he says. And he says, now, or beloved, now we are the sons of God right now. We got the name. We're kind of moving in that direction. And yet it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, that tells me a couple of things. That tells me the reason we're not more like him is we're not seeing him as he is. Because if we were, we would be a whole lot more like Jesus. And can I, can I ask you, because this has been kind of running around in my spirit, the problem with the Protestant movement is the Protestant movement was still dealing with a Roman Jesus, a Romanized Jesus. Now, God has tried to bless as much as he could over the years, but as he begins to pour out more light, God's requiring us to walk in it. And we're serving a Hebrew Lord a Jewish king sitting on the throne of David, the one who gave Moses the commandments. That's the God, that, that's the Jesus, and if you're not serving that Jesus, you're serving another Jesus, an antichrist Jesus. I'm going to get letters on that one, but write them to God because he's the one who's dealing with this, not me. I'm just telling you like it is. If you don't like it, heaven isn't going to change We've got to. That's right. we, have, we have got to change our attitude about the Word of God. Because, yeah. I mean, there's several things that we have to deal with. The more that we see him as he really is, the more we become as he is. That's right. But we got some catching up to do because some of us aren't really going to be able to fully transition until he shows up and we're going to say, that's what you were like. That's why Revelation, that spooky, spooky book, is called the revelation of who Jesus really is. Because we have gotten so far away from who he is, it's a spooky book. No, it's not. It's a glorious book. Because God finally says, I have had enough. You had six days, I'm going to have my day. The book of Revelation is the transition from the six days of man reign to the one day of God's reign or the 6,000 years of man's civilization and reign to the millennial reign. And, that, and for Jesus to reign, he's got to say, I have had enough. That's it. Your iniquity has gotten full, O earth, and I'm coming back and I'm getting ready. I'm going to reap that which is mine, and the rest of it's going to be in the wine press of my wrath. It doesn't sound to me like Jesus is some uh, Southern California beach bum that wears sandals and just everything's cool. He said, listen, I give you long enough and you won't hear, you get mad at my prophets and, they, and you won't fund them when they tell you the truth and I have had enough. Here's something else that we've got to deal with, verse three. And everyone that hath this hope in him, in, hope in him purifieth himself even as he, Jesus, is pure. Now believer, listen to me good. If your eschatological views don't cause you to become more holy, your, es your eschatology is wrong. Another inconvenient truth in the Word of God. You see, this, this whole pre-tribulation rapture thing has put the church to sleep. It, they're, they're not doing anything. The, I'm just, God's going to get me out of here before it gets too bad. Well, then why didn't he get the Christians out of here during Roman rule when they, were being, when they were being burned alive, when they were being thrown to lions, when you see all the things that the Caesars did to them? Why did, why did God not rapture the church when the Roman Catholic Church was killing millions of Protestants? 
Why isn't he coming back today? In countries where Islam is burning down churches and killing believers and shooting pastors like a bunch of gangsters. One of the princes in Saudi Arabia today, it was in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, says that I think that every Christian church, one that is not Islamic, should be destroyed in our nation. Why isn't Jesus coming back then? You see, we, we have built air castle theology based upon the blessings that God had done for this nation in the past. And the reason it's getting ready to go downhill very quickly is we have left the ways that previous generations had made covenant with God. And I, when I look at the state of the body of Christ, your view of the return of Jesus is not causing you to purify yourself. Therefore, your view is wrong. Something is amiss. Yeah, right. This word here for purify in the Greek is hagnizo, which means to both become ceremonially and morally clean. Inconvenient truth because the book of Leviticus deals with both ceremonially clean and morally clean. That's what the Torah deals with. And the Apostle John says, if you look for him, you're going to become, you're not going to touch anything unclean and you're not going to do anything unclean. If you're not doing this, you're looking for the coming of another Jesus. And there's only two. I'm going to rock your world. There's only two. The real Jesus of Nazareth, and what the Illuminati calls the king of despots. Dispot, tyrant, very, 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 very bad dude. That is intolerant of anything <laughs> holy and good. And I'm seeing a lot of the body of Christ, if that would become faddish, they would follow after it like a dog after a treat. That's one of the reasons why the Word of God says beware of dogs. They follow after anything that pet their head and give them a treat. Mm -mm. Just in case we just missed what he meant by this purification, let's read the next verse, shall we? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. But John, haven't you read Paul? Yeah, almost 30 years before. We dealt with that last week. The very last epistle of Paul was written in 67 A.D. 1 John was written in 90 A.D. And so he's saying, he's saying you, bunch of, you bunch of wild Gentiles that misinterpret what Paul was dealing with, let me tell it to you straight. Transgression of the commandments of God is sin. It will always be sin. It was sin in the garden. It will be sin in the millennial reign. It will always be sin. And you're supposed to be purifying yourself from violating God's commandments. He just wanted to make it really clear. Whosoever committeth sin transgress also the law. Underline this in your Bible. For sin is the transgression of the law. Guys, I have read that in Christian churches, and I have had men of God tell me, I've got a problem with that. No, you don't. You don't get to argue with this book. Sin is the transgression of the law. The Bible says, let him who sins, sin no more. That's right. Purification means I stop violating the law and start doing it because of what God has done in my life. Now, John's not done with his pastoral epistle here yet. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. In him is no sin. In Jesus is no sin. When I see him, I will be like him. In Jesus, there is no sin. In Jesus, there is no violation of the Torah. And when I see him, I'll be like him. Right. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him as a lifestyle and as a theology does not violate the commandments of God. 
Whosoever sinneth or whosoever makes a doctrine out of not doing the commandments has not seen him nor neither know him. Ouch. Whew. That's scary. That's why we have people like John MacArthur said, you know, the problem with most of the body of Christ is 90% of them aren't saved. In his, in his book on the gospel according to Jesus. I tell you what, when you get the gospel according to Jesus, it'll slap you down, pick you back up, slap you down again, and then give you resurrection power to get back up. It's strong. And we've made it some little panty waist thing. Little limp-wristed, no power the Apostle Paul said the gospel is the power of God. The power of God to what? To get you born again and to get you to where you're walking in God's commandments. That you have the ability to crucify the flesh, tell the flesh, no, God says this, my flesh says this, which one's going to die? Which, one's, which one am I going to absolutely not yield to anymore? My flesh or God's commandments? And most of the body has said we will not yield to God's commandments. Because if we get enough of us together, we can group together and feel good about ourselves. Heaven doesn't feel good about it. Let's go on here with verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Throw up a red flag in your Bible right there. Children, let no one deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Now the Apostle John has already declared what righteousness is, keeping the commandments of God. If I am born again, we dealt with last week that the, that the, that the commandments of God are written on my heart, and when I start living from my heart, I begin doing those commandments out of love for God and out of faith in what he has done for me in Jesus, and the heaven declares that righteousness. Righteousness is doable. You can't do it without Jesus. The Apostle Paul has already said, listen, if you say Jesus is the Son of God, but you don't have the commandments, you're of Antichrist. Or if you keep the commandments, but you don't declare that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, you're Antichrist. you got to have both. Verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Those that say, I don't have to keep the word of God and I'm getting to heaven, the apostle John just said, you're of the devil. That makes up most of what's on Christian television right now. There's a few. There's a remnant. Not the real popular ones either. Why? Because they're not of this world and the world won't support it. The world won't clamor to it. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. For this reason Jesus came, that he could destroy within you the desire to break God's commandments and to place within you a heart to keep them. If the gospel doesn't include that, it's not the gospel. For whosoever is born of God... Doth, uh, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, it's not talking about occasionally stumbling. How many know we're all prone to stumble? It's out of our theologies and out of our doctrines or our ways of life, I do not break God's commandments if I'm really born of God, and my theology must be an expression of what God has done on the inside of my heart. And let me tell you something, a lot of our theologies are based upon what God has not done in their hearts. And they try to call it church. Verse 10, in this the children of God are, made, are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not God. His brothers. Now, there's, there's several things. You, you could take all of the gospel, or, or 1 John here, and when in Jesus and Matthew, when they asked him in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. 
The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That is basically everything John is writing about here in 1 John is based upon what Jesus just said there. And he was quoting the Shema that every Jewish individual on the planet prays at least twice a day. Because we need to daily remind ourselves, I show God that I love him by keeping his commandments. In fact, it's expressed in Deuteronomy 11, 13, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt heart darken diligently, unto my commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now let me tell you something. God does not equate you loving him by coming here in the praise and worship service and blowing him little kisses. I don't care how many goosebumps you get. God says if you're not proving your love during, with me during the week by keeping my commandments, your little kisses don't mean a thing. Your goosebumps during praise and worship don't mean a thing because you're a two-timer. You're like the husband who's a traveling salesman that will sleep with anything during the week and then come back on the weekends and kiss his wife. Come on, let's call a spade a spade. That's exactly what we're talking about here. That's why in so many congregations, they've got to rev things up, stir up the flesh. That's exactly what the Gnostics did. They had to stir up the flesh and give the people what they wanted to hear. Let me tell you something. What I'm preaching right now and what I will continue preaching as long as I have breath, your flesh will not ever want to hear. But heaven will. Man, this... Paul's, or John's, is real plain here, isn't he? That's one of the reasons nobody ever preaches out of it. They'll take snippets. They'll, they'll, but nobody ever does much of anything else. Now, let, let's deal with confidence versus condemnation. 1 John three nineteen through 20. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and, and shall assure our hearts before him. But if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. And I've had people constantly throw this up and say, well, see, I don't have to keep the commandments. I got this. He's not talking about that. He's saying, listen, you're going to stumble because he's already said in chapter 1 that if any man says he has no sin, he's a liar. But he said in verse 9 of chapter 1, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I do stumble and I step out of my confidence, I run to Jesus and repent, and he restores my confidence. That's why when you, and guys, this, this may be a clue. I've had a lot of believers tell me over the years, you know, I'm praying, but it seems like the words are just coming out of my mouth and hitting the ground. I don't know why. I go to church. I tithe. I read my Bible. But it just seems like it just goes, you know why? Your heart is where the commandments of God were written. And then man's theology wrote on your head, I don't have to keep them. And your heart says, I have no confidence. You know what will transform your prayer life and transform the results you see in your prayer life? When you go to the Father and say, I was taught wrong and I repent for breaking your commandments and your heart begins to say, I can work with that now. Because he, and it, it, I mean, when you really feel the weight of it, it may take you a while for your head and your feelings to catch up with, with, with your heart. Because, I, I mean, when, when I did this, guys, my head was heavy for a while. It's like... God, not only, was I, not only was I a simpleton out in the congregation preaching I didn't have to, you know, believing I didn't have to keep the commandments, I was preaching it because that's what I had been taught. And so when I went to Jesus and I said, I am sorry, my heart began to lift, but my head was saying, Mike, you got a lot of tapes to destroy. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there could be a bounty I would pay on some of my older tapes if you have them. Please send them in and I'll give you $10 a tape so that I can destroy them. But he's faithful and just that if I repent, he, he, and, and, I, and repenting means you've got to come to grips with what you have done and you've got to say, I'm sorry for the real thing that I've done. Not just, not just that I feel bad, but that I've been bad. We have a lot of people say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But if you could hear their hearts, they would say, I'm sorry I got caught, and next time I will be more sneaky. 
I've heard that so much more on, on television anymore. Anytime I see a politician or a preacher or anybody say, I'm sorry, the next thing, I, I can hear it in spirit. Next time I'll be more careful, nobody will find out. How many know when you're doing righteousness, everybody can find out what you're doing? Don't care who finds out. Let's go on a little bit further. Verse 21 and 22 of 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then. Then have we confidence toward God. That's what causes your faith to soar. I've got confidence toward God. I can come in and I can come boldly before his throne that I might receive help in a time of need. Let me tell you something. When your heart knows that you got sin, you just kind of have a hard time really getting there. Mr. God, I really like your help. I know you're probably not going to hear me. That's how a lot of them on the inside people are praying. They try to get real bold, but on the inside, there's that. But man, when you've done right, God, Father God, I have confidence because I did the right thing. The devil tried to mess me up, and I did the right thing. Therefore, I have assurance that your kingdom is going to go into operation for me. I was in your kingdom. I refused to partake of the kingdom of darkness. Therefore, he's encroaching on your kingdom. Well, Mike, I don't believe that's the translation. Well, finish reading John here because he gives you what he's talking about here. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Amen, Brother Mike, stop right there. Just, just stop right there. I've got confidence. Whatever I ask, I'm going to receive of him. But there's that word, because. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Man, why'd you have to bring that up? Because it's essential to getting your prayers answered. You can't play with the devil all week, and when he gets rough, expect Jesus to rescue you. So keeping the commandments is a roadway to confidence in prayer. Why? I, how many of us, you know, you can even be on the job, and something kind of went wrong, and so they're trying to, and they start playing the blame game. Somebody's already trying to pass the buck. I tell you what, when you got your ducks in the row and you can lay it down with spreadsheets or whatever and say, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. The blame doesn't belong here. You get confidence in that meeting. It's the guy who wants to go, it's Jimmy's fault. That's the guy. That's the guy who did it. And he has no confidence. You see, when I, want to get, when I go to God... I want to stand in who Jesus is, and I want to stand in what he's done in me, and because I've been doing what he's done, when I've been doing what he's done in me, I have confidence that I can stand before a righteous judge. And I can say, I am making a demand. Now, this is what, in fact, I got a call this week on it. When Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he would give it to you, that word in the Greek means the command or demand. And they say, well, I can just command God. You want to be a grease spot? I mean, there's, there's books in the charismatic movement making, commanding and demanding God. You start doing it out of your flesh, you will become a grease spot. You will become an enigma. You will become an abnormality, okay? <laughs> but when we look at it, let, let's, say, let's say I was doing business dealings with another person and they cheated me and I did exactly what the law said and they broke the law. When I go before a judge and I put forth my complaint, I am making a demand that the law of the nation be enforced in this situation. I am making a demand of the judge based upon the laws and the statutes that are over this nation. And so when I come before God, I can stand and I am a law-abiding citizen who has followed the commandments and the laws of the kingdom, and therefore I can stand before the judge and say, look what the devil has done. I have done exactly what you required, and he is violating your law and therefore I come to give testimony of what this culprit is doing and I am asking that he be arrested in my life and I can have confidence that what I ask is according to his law verse 23 through 24 abiding in him and this is the commandment that we should believe on the on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave commandment so even believing 
You know, we always talk about, you know, salvation is not of works. There's no commandment to follow to get saved. Yes, there is. If you don't believe on the real Jesus, if you don't believe on Jesus, you don't get saved. That is a command. That is not a request. There is not another way. There is no other way into heaven except through Jesus. And if you don't do that command, you're not getting in. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. How many times do we have to have that repeated in the word? It was repeated by Jesus over and over again in the Gospels. It was repeated by the, the apostles, and we take some snippets of some sound bites of what the Apostle Paul said, not even bringing it back into the context of what he was dealing with. And we, we say, I can abide in him without the commandments. You cannot, because if you do, you make the Apostle John and Jesus himself a liar. Herein are you my disciples indeed, if you keep or abide in my word. And Hebraically, there's no way to abide in it without doing it. And hereby we know that we abideth, uh, that he abideth in us by the spirit which he has given us. So a proof of a man abiding in Jesus is he keeps God's commandments out of a love for Jesus. Proof that God is abiding with him is you can feel the Holy Spirit dwelling in that man. That's why I can go to a lot of churches and there's only four or five here and there that there's a kindred spirit among us because the kindred spirit is not my spirit to their spirit. It's the Holy Ghost within and me and the Holy Ghost within with them. And the ones that can't identify with me are of another spirit. And I can tell by the Holy Spirit dwelling there that they're abiding in Jesus and they're walking in his commandments. You can also tell by the scowl on their face when you begin talking about the commandments in a favorable light and their nose wrinkles up and their forehead begins to wrinkle and you start seeing the fire of defiance in their eyes. They're of another spirit. And it's not the spirit of God, it's the spirit of Antichrist. I don't care what church they call it. Whew, this got a lot harder than I wanted it to be, but that's okay. God knows what he's doing. John chapter 1 John 4, 1 through 3. I've had this one thrown up in my face like somebody knows something many, many times. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets. It's just trying the spirit that's behind the prophet. Okay. Has gone unto her whereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, we, we have been so, because we've already dealt with that in this series, saying that Jesus Christ is come. You are the, the, the Apostle Peter said it, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Jesus, you are Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come in the flesh. Let me tell you something. If our theology tells us that Jesus is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come in the flesh, it's another spirit and another gospel. You're a Mar you're, you're, you're Marcionistic, which the early church declared was a heretic. I mean, Polycarp, the first, the Poly, you, know, you guys know who Polycarp was. He was a he was a direct his 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 mentor was the Apostle John, the guy who wrote this book. And so when Marcion showed up, John had already gone to be in, with his reward, and Polycarp was one of the leaders in the church. When Marcion came, they gave him back his big gift of money, and Polycarp said, "I, I, I just because of what I have been taught with the Apostle John, I just want to make clear who you are. You're the firstborn son of Satan. I hit the road." Marcion taught we don't have to keep the commandments. Marcion taught that Jesus was a, was a different God and conquered the God of the Old Testament. And if, and if we say that because of what Jesus did on the cross, he conquered the law and set it aside, that means he conquered the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and outdid him. You are a spirit of Antichrist. I mean, anymore, there's, there's, no, there's no time for mincing words anymore. Because if we don't understand what he's dealing with here and taking it in the whole context, any demon from hell will tell you that Jesus came in the flesh. Any liberal moron that's a university professor that is a secularist and a humanist will say that Jesus lived on the earth. And we think, well, I've done tried to spare it. He said Jesus came in the flesh. Hitler believed that Jesus came in the flesh. 
Stalin believed that Hitler came in the flesh. Every one of those on Capitol Hill believed that Jesus came in the flesh. It doesn't mean they're operating by his spirit because they deny that he is God come in the flesh. Which God? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if they don't say Jesus is that, they're antichrist. According to the Apostle John. Mm. <laughs> and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, spirit is italicized in the King James. They're just kind of putting it in there to make more sense. The Apostle Zion says that these people say that they're of Antichrist. They're of Antichrist. Whereby we know... Uh, that it should come and now is already in the world. John was already having to deal with that in the church in his day, thanks to the Gnostics, which are now being hailed as geniuses in many of our universities and even seminaries. And those are cemeteries, by the way. I, I had one student, and I mean, she's just doing wonderfully. Rose is doing wonderfully. And... Uh, and she says, she said, I almost didn't enroll in biblical life because I was always been taught seminary equals cemetery. And she said, but when I went to your start, side and started reading the words, the Spirit of God was there so strong, I began, have, I began having tears run down my eyes. And she said, I knew this was the place. This ain't no cemetery. You see, when you teach this right, seminary is what it's supposed to be. Church is what it's supposed to be. Otherwise, it's a, uh, and if you don't, it's a place where believers die. Now this one everybody loves to quote in, uh, verse 4. Year of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you, greater is he that is in you. I never read you the verses before or after, because we dislike that phrase. <laughs> we overcome the Antichrist spirit because the Holy Spirit on the inside of us is telling us the commandments are true, that God's word is holy, that it is pure, that it is honest, and that who Jesus really is. That's greater in you. Yes, that's right. Then he picks up in verse 6, spirit of truth versus spirit of error. We are of God. <coughs> he that knoweth God heareth us. He that knoweth not God heareth not us. I can say that with biblical life real easy because of the way that I preach. There's a lot of Christians don't hear a word I got to say. They don't want to hear it. It's hard on your flesh. It'll build up your spirit, give you some spiritual muscle, but it's hard on your flesh. And hereby we do know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If they don't want to hear the truth of what God's word says about who Jesus is and what his commandments are in relation to us, it separates those who have given themselves to a spirit of truth and those that have given themselves to a spirit of error. Guys, there's not a week goes by that I do not get an email from somebody, sometimes more than one, saying, we found you on the internet. Thank God because we're starving to death. Starving to death. They go to church, they listen to Christian television, they listen to Christian radio, and they're starving to death. It's cotton candy theology. Literally, there's no bones about it because there ain't any meat either. I mean, no, it's real easy not to find a bone in cotton candy. But when, you get, when you're given a big steak, you might just find a bone, you gotta, you gotta gnaw around just a little bit. And we're so, we're, we're so used to Christian junk food, if you, you, can, you can make air really sweet and get addicted to it. You know, the other day I saw one of those big cupcakes or whatever, you know, that's loaded with sugar and loaded with, and it said, enhanced with vitamins. I don't know about you, but my flesh, I got to talk to things like that as I go by in the store. You a liar. 
I, I'm, I'm like that one that one commercial where that girl looks at that cake and this does, calls it a mean cake. You're not really a real sheriff, you know. You, sometimes someone like you got to talk to, I'm not going to have you. You're a liar. You're sweet, and you're going to clog up my arteries. And so what if I get a couple extra B vitamins? Everything else in you is going to suck the life out of me and make me look like the, the, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. You know what I mean? And it's enhanced with vitamins. That's the way our theology is. Our theology is 99% candy with a little smackling of pleasant truth. And we call it church. My job is to kill you on the installment plan, to get you to where you take the hammer and the nail and you crucify the flesh so that you can have a resurrection of spiritual power. We want resurrection power without a crucifixion. Doesn't work. Jesus said, is there any other way? And the answer he got was no. And if Jesus got a no, guess what you're going to get? Just a thought. Pick up with verse 15. Whosoever, uh, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believe uh, the love that God has given uh, hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Church, the day we're going we're gonna to come a time where we need the day of boldness because judgment is coming. We're going to need to have that love made perfect because, the, the, because judgment is coming. Because as he is, so are we in this world. You know, most believers can't say that because you act nothing like Jesus. You act like the Roman Jesus who has his own laws, his own holidays, his own ways of doing things. And Jesus that used to preach in Jerusalem has his own laws, his own holidays. I never see Jesus once saying, come on, everybody, let's celebrate my birthday. Right. You know why they wouldn't do that? No Jew back then ever did that. That was a pagan practice because it's the day of self. And so pagans would make a birthday cake unto Artemis, and, and they would put candles up there, one for every year that they were born, and they would give homage to Artemis as they blew out the candles and, and gave a, a, a cake to the queen of heaven. We, we never question all of our stuff. Jesus would have never done that. In fact, the Bible does not in any place tell us to remember his birth. It tells us to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the command. And yet we can't even get that on the right day. We can't even count. The Bible says three days he was in the tomb. We do it a day and a half and call it, well, that's close enough for government work. It's not close enough for the kingdom. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, I mean, that's, that's, uh, we're, we're going to end up in a day, guys. The Bible says in the last days men's hearts will fail for fear. Do you know how you can get over that kind of a heart attack? When you keep the commandments and get embedded into God's love, fear can't get a hold of you. That's what, that's what was going in in the hearts of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That, that they had the fiery furnace before them, and they said, I'm, I'm not going to fear. God saves me. God saves me. As you don't, I know where I'm going to be. Because I'm not of this world anymore. I'm just passing through. But most Christians sit there and wring their hands in fear. Why? Because your spirit's telling you, I haven't done all, any of the things that I'm supposed to be doing, but yet now all of a sudden I'm worried that God's not going to do his part. He had no confidence. First John 5. I think we may, how much, how much time have I got left here? Because I'm going to really try to keep it an hour. I've got 16 minutes. I can do it. Boy, you can really preach through this stuff quick, can't you? Um, Verse 1 of chapter 5, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begotteth loveth him also is of the begotten. By this we know that we love the children of God. We give them sandwiches. We pat them on the head. We tell them everything's going to be okay. Now, he's already said we, we show God that we love him by keeping his commandments, but how do we really love those around us? When we love God and keep his commandments is how we show love. You see... What's happening in churches is 
You really got to you really got to nail down your women in some churches because the pastors would be chasing after them or the deacons would be chasing after them. I mean, there's adultery. There's all different kinds of things going on in church. Anytime I have ever been ripped off, it has never been by a sinner. It's been by a saint. In fact, I kind of dread dealing with big churches because the big churches are always the ones that have ripped the school off. The little churches, they make sure every T is crossed, every die is out of They make sure that all the tuitions are paid and everything. Big churches, well, we don't have to do that. We're so big. Well, I know what you're of. You see, if we keep his commandments, then you don't have to worry about me doing you wrong. You don't have to worry about me less than after your wife or, or less than after the things that you have in your life. There's no need for social justice because I have kingdom justice and God bless the works of my hands and I don't have to lust after what you have and say, you know what, if we can get enough of us together, we can march on Washington and take your stuff. Yeah, that makes you a legal thief. And that's what's getting ready to be the spirit of people that are preaching that. Now there are some millionaires and billionaires that have gotten their gain illegally. There are. Few. But I know some people that have become millionaires. Their average work week is 70 to 90 hours. They create good jobs for people. Are always worried about giving their people the right benefits. It's not always the bottom line. In fact, one guy, his, his motto is, my bottom line are my people. He wants, he wants his business to increase so that he can pay his people more. And so now we're going to have people come and take his stuff because they don't like working over 15 hours a week. That's theft. That's not following God's commandments. You see, as I see you walking with God and I see you blessed because you're keeping the commandments, that, that spurs me on to righteousness because I know God is not a respecter of persons. And if I do the commandments and walk with him, God can bless me according to my abilities. But let me tell you something, really, Guys, most of the people that I talk to that have been wounded the greatest in their life have been wounded in church, not out of church. And it's because that church did not show their love for God nor for man because they did not keep his commandments. Because the commandments set boundaries. I'll never do this because I love God, and that sets up a place of safety for you. Now look what he says here. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. God's commandments are never grievous. Man's are. Jesus never once in his entire ministry corrected a commandment of God, but he was constantly correcting and coming against the commandments of men or how men twisted the commandments of God to make them impossible. How about just taking the plain text and doing it? Not hard. Verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and we know that he heareth, heareth us, if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition desired of him, according to his will. What is his will? His word. We're so worried, is it God's will that I get a new car? And we, we confine it to that. If you have been keeping his commandments and God can bless the works of your hands and the works of your hands require a new car, it's coming. But he's not going to give you a new car so that you can keep up with the Joneses and impress everybody with all the flesh that you have. God may, for your sake, keep you from that new car because your spirit is more important than puffing up your flesh. But see, if I know I've been doing what, and, and I can be trusted with those blessings, if I can be trusted with those blessings, there are some believers today that if they won the lottery, they would stop serving God. They would. They no longer have to trust in him. Some people use even the church as a welfare station. You see, one of the reasons why I'm preaching the way I am, I'm preaching the way I am so that you will never need welfare. But you can begin blessing others. You're supposed to be blessed to be a blessing. 
Verse 16, if any man sees his brother sin, a sin that is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall, uh, and shall give him life for them that sinneth not unto death. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that you shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So not all violation of God's commandments will cost you your life or cost you your salvation. What would? Denying Christ. I mean, that's a big one. You know what's scary? If you begin bearing false witness and begin teaching another Jesus, you are denying Christ. And John says, now there's some, there's, when, 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 there's some people that when you pass that, the book of Hebrews said there's no more, there, there's no more sacrifice. You, you, you've, you've denied the very sacrifice that gets you in. It's impossible for you. But if I see a brother that's, that's violating the commandments and starting getting caught up into sin, I can pray, God can deposit within me an anointing that I can go and deliver him from that unrighteousness. That's important. But you can't do that and can't believe that if you don't even know what sin is. In some churches, sin is not showing up on Wednesday night or not showing up on Sunday night or not being a part of this program or that program. You see, when you eliminate God's sin, you have to create your own list. Heaven doesn't care about your list. And I'm trying to say that very diplomatically because stronger words are coming to mind. God only cares about his list. There's a reason that ten of them were written in stone. Selah. <laughs> why, why, why is all this so important? Why is all this so important for the days ahead? Let's look at verse 18. Do you want to be an overcomer? We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Whosoever is born of God keeps the commandments. They don't violate the commandments. He has already, he has already stipulated that's what that means over and over and over and over again in this letter, in this epistle. He says, if you're born of God, you're not going to violate the commandments. He that is a begotten of God keepeth himself. What does he mean, keepeth himself? He keeps himself in the commandments of God and keeps himself from sinning. And this is the great part. And the wicked one toucheth him not. There was a time that Satan came to Jesus and Jesus said, you can't touch me because you have nothing in me. You can't touch me because you have nothing in me. Most believers are dancing around with their armor half on, half off, pieces missing, trying to do the MC hammer. Can't touch this. And the devil keeps bopping them in the head and they can't figure out why. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> devil, you're not backing up my theology. And we don't know that is Lucifer's long game to move you away from who Jesus really is and to move you away from the commandments of God. And he let it go for several generations so that when he got to this generation, he could kill out the church. But what he forgot about was the remnant. And heaven is saying, can't touch this. You can't touch this. They are my righteous. They got on their armor. They know who I am. They've got confidence. And the more you push them, the more they push into righteousness. That's why a true believer doesn't whine when stuff happens. They press into God. And they say, I tell you what, there's a devil going down, and my God's going to get glory out of this. Instead of, oh, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Well, the reason you want me to do that is you can't pray for yourself because you have no confidence. Oh, that was a slap upside the head. Yeah. Now we can't even ask Brother Lake to pray for us. <laughs> I mean, no, that's not what I'm talking about, but their attitude is. They're running, oh, pray for me, oh, pray for me, oh, pray for me. Oh. I, like the, I like the guy the attitude. I'm walking with God. I'm doing his commandments. You come in agreement with me, the devil's going down. Now, that kind of guy I can get in line with. The very last commandment, this is the very last thing, the very last phrase of 1 John 5.21, the whole church needs to hear, little children, keep yourself from idols. The end. I mean, 
Keep yourself from idols. That means don't do their holidays, don't do their ways. And if the church would obey this one line, we would have to quit doing 90% of what we're doing. It's like he said, it's like the Apostle John was saying, church, the Laodicean church in the last days, right before I close my epistle, I'm going to reach through time and I'm going to slap you upside the head just one more time. Quit being of Antichrist. Quit coming against God's commandments. Quit trying to give God and his people some pseudo love separate from his commandments because you can't do it. And just so that you really get what I'm saying, don't do stuff with idols. Don't learn pagan ways and try to do it unto God because that's antichrist. And let the chips fall where they may, guys. I don't believe it. I did the whole thing in 30, 60 minutes this morning. <laughs> Next week, we're going to start getting into the book of Revelation. We're just going to go ahead and just follow on with the Apostle Paul just for a little bit. Or Apostle John, can we do that? Yeah, that's good. We're kind of on a... So I want to go and see what the last book in the New Testament was about and see if we can find some commandments in it. See if we can find some stuff in it. We're going to find some stuff. And you ain't going to like the stuff that we're going to find. Number one, you're going to find out you're going to have to go through most of it. And then we say, I just want to be ready. <laughs> when you find out the rapture may happen later on in the book, it, there's not that confidence anymore. You're sitting there holding your golden ticket saying, the train's late. <laughs> no, it's right on time. You just found out it may, you may have thought it showed up about six and a half years before you thought it was going to get there. But see, if you're walking in love, you have boldness, you have confidence. Right. That you say, you know what? If I sink or I swim during the tribulation, I will not bow my knee to the Antichrist. I will not bow my knee to that spirit. I will not violate who Jesus is or his commandments, but I will be strengthen myself in God. Yeah. And that, that'll get to where he can't touch this. And I will not pollute myself. In most churches, there's more pollution than there is clear living water. And I say that as a farmer swimmer in cesspools. Because where I was 20 years ago, I would not tolerate who I am now based upon the theology I used to have. But where I am now, there's a lot of what I used to be I won't tolerate now. Because to be truthful, I was a goofball looking for some place to goof. Really? Wondering how come the word didn't work? How, how come this don't work? Well, I just don't have enough faith. Well, Mike, work our faith. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm working on faith. Faith comes easy if you've been doing what you're supposed to be doing. Then you get like Smith Wigglesworth, there's a story about him when I'm in with this, that in his lifetime there was this huge thunderstorm, and I mean it just, it just lighted up the sky over and over and over again. And he heard something downstairs in the midst of all the stuff, and so, you know, back then you couldn't flip on lights, it was a candle. And he goes down his stairs and he said, Lucifer appeared to him in all his glory in the midst of the ruckus and the, and the, and the thunder and the blowing of the wind and the house was shaking. Smith looks at him and says, oh, it's just you. <laughs> blows out the candor, walks back up in the dark on purpose and goes back to bed. That's having confidence. How much confidence you got? Confidence comes from your heart where the commandments of God have been written by his very hand. And when you start living by that which is on your heart, you get confidence. If you don't, then you're looking for ways to compromise with the devil. No more compromise. No more compromise. Compromise will get you killed. Compromise will get you killed. 
Father God, we just thank you for your word this morning. Father, I thank you that it will not return to you void, but will accomplish where it to you have sent it. And Father, I ask that this anointing would be loosed that would cause believers to begin quit living by the doctrines of men and start living by the commandments of God written on their heart and that they will have boldness. Boldness before God and boldness in the face of the devil himself. Because they're right with God. And they walk that way. Father, let it be so. Father, empower your remnant to raise up with the whole armor of God and the fire of God and the passion of God in their eyes and in their hearts. Father, we ask in Jesus' name.